think it'll help this do so. Oh, I put it in backwards. That's why. Oh, now you're running on your VDI straight. Straight, yeah. <laughs> Computer for uh, in case the VDI decides to blow up. But I think I'm going to trust the VDI a little bit more now. <laughs> Once you install it once, it should be good, but then you have the library then. So library ggplot2. Mm -hmm. Get it in. If it's not, every time you re reopen R, you have the library things back in. So, Alright, it's 3.30, so I guess we will start going. Um, so the first thing we're going to do today, and we're going to try to get everybody kind of on track to how to do this, um, is uh, we're going to pull from the new SDLE tea time repository, um, then we're going to work out of the repository, and at the end of the class, we'll push everything back up, and then we'll leave, and then you come back tomorrow, and we pull again. We'll have new things on there. Uh, so this is just kind of how you would do, you would work if you were working on a project that had multiple collaborators on a project. Um, so the first thing is I hope everyone has a bitbucket.org account um, of some sort. Uh, .edu allows you to have limitless uh, private repositories. Um, you can use another email if you want, but you won't have limitless. Um, and then uh, the second thing is that you have a terminal window that's ready to be used or uh, Git Bash. Um, so Git Bash on Windows is uh, what I use. Do, do some people have those things? All right, cool. And if, if you don't and we go too fast, like uh, you can always watch this later to kind of go through it. So first thing, open up a Git Bash terminal or a terminal. And it's going to put you somewhere on your computer. And usually it's going to be somewhere in, towards the root. And now you need to find uh, a directory that you want to get to. So for a lot of people, this would be documents. The way that you change directories is with the command cd. So cd. Um, and then you want to tell where to go. For me, I have an h directory that I want to go to. So I throw an h. And then up here, it should say uh, mm -hmm. back, or slash h. Okay, so now I'm in that directory. Um, then, if you want to check what's inside your directory, you type in ls, enter. And in here it has all the different things using ls, a lot of files that I should probably clean up at some point because I don't use them anymore. And then the blues are all the folders. So in here I have a folder git that I store all my git stuff in. But as an example, I'll make a new one. So we're in. I'm in my H drive where I want to be. Maybe you guys want to be in your documents or something else. Um, and now I want to do mkdir, which is make directory. And I'm going to say git example 
as my example directory. So git example, all right, there it is. I hit ls again. I'm looking around and now I have a new folder in there, git example. Now you could also do this from the Windows Explorer or the Mac Explorer and manually right click new folder and put those things in there, but this is how we do it through the command window. So now, we have, now I have git example. I'm gonna go into git example, so cd git example, and you should probably call yours just git or something else that you wanna call it. Um, and so now I'm in git example. Uh, so now that I'm in there, I'm going to move over to bitbucket.org. And so if you go to bitbucket, and then, which I will redo this, <coughs> bitbucket.org. Um, let's see if I can sign out. Where is it? Sign out so I don't, well, anyways. You, uh, you go to it, you log in, and then uh, you want to search. 16-SDLE-T, and that should probably be enough for you. And if you search, it should come up as 16-SDLE-T time. So you should be able to find that. You guys... And this is a public it? repository that everyone yeah. should be able to find. Yeah. So it's a public repository that everyone has access to, and you can read it. Um, myself, Jack, and Roger all have administrative accesses, that way we can change things in there. And, um, but you can all use it and look at it and everything. So the thing that we want to do is if we go over to actions and we want to hit fork. So we want to fork this repository for ourselves. So we hit fork and then we want to give it a name. I'm going to give it SDLET time even. Um, just my name, my own, and it'll make now a fork of that repository, but it's going to be your own one that you get to own and you get to push things back and forth through. Um, so I'm going to hit fork repository. It's going to take a little bit to fork it. And so now this is the new repository. So you should all have now a new repo repository with your name or something that you wanted to say about it. Um, then the next thing we want to do is we want to go to actions and we want to clone this. So we're going to hit clone and a nice git command pops up in here. Uh, we're going to copy it. So if you're doing this on Windows, it's, it's easiest to do it with HTTPS. On Mac or on Linux, it's nice to do it with SSH. And so I just, I'll copy this and then I'll go over to git example where I have this. And I'm going to use control shift insert on Windows, which pastes in um, what I just copied. So it's all sitting there. Really all it is is it's the command git clone and then um, the repository URL dot git. Um, and so if I put that in there and I hit git clone, it will start cloning into the repository. So it's gonna sit there, it's gonna grab a ton of things, download them all, and put them all neat. So, oh, so let's check out the files, and now it's done. Any anybody need help going, getting to this point? All right. And now, um, now let's look ls and get example. Um, now inside of get example, my repository folder, I now have a repository, and it's 16 sdle t time even. Um, so I can cd into that one, cd 16 dash, and a pro tip for this is if you hit tab, it'll auto-complete, as long as that's the only thing left in there, tab will auto-complete. So, all right, now I'm in there. And it says that I'm the master, so I'm in the master branch. We'll talk about branching and other things later, and really what Git is able to do, Jack will talk about that. Uh, but the master branch means that this is the, the most important one, this is the one that other people see. And if I hit ls, it'll show me everything that's inside of there. Um, so I've got code, readings, topics, um, some other things, readme, uh, link to the Bitbucket repo, Periscope, and YouTube. Um, now if I go into the Windows Explorer, or any Explorer, and I go and find my H drive, 
and I go into Git example, and now this is sitting there. Go in here, we can just kind of browse a little bit more visually real quick. So if I'm looking in here, we've got code, and a lot of the stuff that we've been doing is gonna be under scripts. So scripts has um, T time class one, class two. I just uploaded T time class two in there. It also has the data file that we were using in the last class. Um, you can go back. Uh, we'll also probably be putting some things in files at some point. Packages and modules will be a little bit different. Modules will probably hold a lot of the Python things that we're doing later. Um, if we go all the way back, there's readings. And so this is a collection of public readings that um, Roger has amassed throughout time. Um, and there's plenty of them uh, with a lot of different information in there, a lot of good stuff with R. Uh, you can browse through it, find a lot of different things. There's some good links just to useful data science books and there's some useful data science papers, which since they're copyrighted, we can't distribute that. Yeah, <coughs> you can still check them out. Science. Um, and then last thing's topics, and this will be where we put some RMDs when we get to that. Um, so these are kind of all the things that are inside the particular repo, all right? So now that we're all cloned, we've got everything in there. Um, now, you can go and click on uh, Tea Time Class 2. Um, I changed some things in it, so that would probably be the best one. It's all filled out and nice, but um, that's okay. So, uh, to kind of go back into R, and, and actually before we go into that, does anybody have any problems with um, get, getting any of that? All right, we're good to go. All right, so let's go down to tea time class two. All right, so we left off kind of here where I was showing you the NOAA weather stuff and making the plot of it. I figured out what I did wrong and why the second plot wasn't working. Um, so if I just catch us back up to where we were, reading in the data, um, changing the um, date time format to POSIX CT, um, making the nice plot that we had, takes a little bit to do the, client, uh, to do the, uh, the date formatting. All right, now it's gonna make the plot over here. And the one piece that I had messed up yesterday was basically this section right here um, was me going through and parsing the data so that way it could make a nice graph. Um, the command minus and then concatenate one to 96 in this row index basically says let's delete the rows 1 to 96. Um, and the reason why I want to do that was I wanted to get two weeks of data and if you have too much data in there it's not going to plot those. Um, so I was getting rid of a day and then I was getting rid of a ton more data and a ton more data. This little piece right here I didn't have to find so it didn't know what to do. Um, so if I run through this real quick and it should be all fixed on the one that you just opened. Uh, just deleting some data out of there and making a new data set and plotting um, something a little bit more up close and uh, it's a week's worth of data instead of two years of data. So now it looks, you can see what's actually kind of happening up close, um, seeing two different climates and then using a package called rmis, which is r miscellaneous, has a ton of random things in it. Um, and then you library it in. It has a nice function called multiplot. So what multiplot does is it takes your plotting objects that you've now made. So we made plot one and plot two, and those are saved in as objects. We can now call those objects and plot them together in one window. So by doing multi multiplot, it's gonna put them all in here. And I'm gonna zoom so we can see it nicer. So now it's got all the data in there um, for two years. That's what it looks like. Now for one week, this is what it looks like. So we can push our plots together and make them look really nice. Right. Um, and now I realized I didn't go over yesterday on how you really want to utilize data frames for plotting in ggplot. Um, the way that you plot in basic graphics is kind of one one area of thought and the way that you can make your data frames is completely different than the way 
you need to make your data frames for uh, using ggplot and making sure you utilize the options that it has. So I have a little bit of an example here of how to do that. Um, so we're going to go through and we're going to make a data frame. Um, and I like to just make a matrix of whatever I want my data frame to be and then I convert it over to a data frame. Um, there might be a better command to do that. I'm not sure. That's just what I can type it out real quick so I always do it. Um, and now, so we have a matrix of 30 rows, 3 columns, and we've now called it data frame. So it's sitting up here. It says 30 observations of 3 variables. Um, we're gonna, we've already changed it to a data frame. And now we want to change all the columns to the different variables that we're going to store. So the first one using the function column names. So we're going to say column names of this data frame, the very first column, we want that to be x value. And then for the second column, we want that to be y value. And for the third column, we're going to call that true. Um, now let's create an array of values. Uh, I'm going to use the function sequence, like we've been using a lot of other times, to make 0 to 2 pi, essentially, um, and 30 intervals, or 29 intervals. Um, and now I'm going to assign all of those x values into the data frame A in the column x values. So assign that over. And uh, now we're going to do a little bit, if we look at A, it's just going to be a ton of zeros and the x values are all filled out. Um, now when we're making this plot, all the x values are going to be the same for this particular one. We're going to use the same x values, but we're going to put different functions to it. So we want the same exact x values in each one of the data frames that we make. Um, so we're just going to copy over and say, uh, let's, and this is a nice convention of saying b is going to equal c, which is going to equal a. So a is going to go into c, and then it's going to go into b. And now we'll have a, B, and C, and they're all going to be exactly the same. So B over here has all the X values and has the exact same X values. Um, now let's create the Y values. So we're just going to use um, Y1, Y2, and Y3. We're going to do sine, cosine, and then really Y3 is tangent because it's sine over cosine. And we've got those. Um, and so we're just using the X values again. And now we can go through and set to the A, B, and C data frames that we have. We can set the Y value to Y1, the Y value for B to Y2, and then C, Y3. So if we go back over and we look at our data frame, we've got our X value, our Y value, and there's nothing in this column yet. Um, and now we're going to label them. So we're going to label the A1 as, that's going to be sine, and the B1 is cosine, and C1 is tangent. And if we look at A again, we can see that all of A is labeled as sine. Uh -oh. Go away. And uh, now the final thing to do with our data frames is so we have our different data sets. They're in three different data frames. They're labeled. They have the correct x values we want and the correct y values we want. Now we're going to bind them into one big data frame for ggplot to handle. So uh, the way that you want to do it is always use rbind because you want the same exact columns that you had and now just make the data frame bigger. So we'll use rbind to put a, b, and c together. And if we view that, now we've got 90 rows, uh, 30 of sine, 30 of cosine, and 30 of tangent. Okay, so now we can make it in ggplot. So we're going to say uh, plot.trig is going to equal ggplot the data is trig. Using that aesthetic uh, function, we're going to call x as the x value, y is going to be the y value, and our color is going to be trig. And then we have to add at the end, and this is very important, geom underscore line. It doesn't have to have size in there, but size is one of the things you can tell it. Um, size equals 1.1. So if you don't have geom line in there, you can run ggplot and nothing's going to plot. It's just going to show up a blank screen over here. It's actually going to show a blank screen, but it's not going to plot anything. You have to tell it to plot points or tell it to plot lines. You have to tell that ggplot, when it does its original function, just says, all right, we're ready to plot. Tell us next what to do. Next thing to do, let's do uh, geometry line, um, and we're going to 
make it a certain size. So we make that. It saves it into plot.trig, which is a list of nine. And if we run plot.trig, it's going to make that nice plot. So we've got everything labeled, tangent, sine, cosine, different colors, our x values, our y values, all that's kind of nice. Um, now we know that um, uh, it's actually undefined for tangent in two different areas, so we're like, oh, it's making our axes really big. Maybe we want to change our axes, and the way to do that is with YLM, which changes your limits. And um, it's an, the additive nature of ggplot allows us just to put it on top of the previous plot. So we can just layer this one on and it replaces. So if we have plot.tree, which is our object, we're just going to add ylim on top of it. So um, there it goes. Doesn't really look that nice, kind of. I mean, maybe it might be art, but it's not what we were looking for. So we're going to go back and say, let's make the limits negative 5 to 5. And we still, don't, we still don't really like it, so we're just going to go back and um, this actually is not a correct thing. I thought that maybe none would mm -hmm. take away the limits, uh, but actually just puts a character limit right in the middle of none and then just plots the, the figure on there. So um, that actually didn't work, so I'm just going to reset it. Uh, I couldn't find the actual solution to how you just get rid of your limits again. I tried ylim null, but it didn't work. So if we reassign it back to what we had before, plot.tree, and run plot.tree again, there's our thing with our plot with the nice axes again, and now we can make it all nice and add a ton of different things. So typically for me, this kind of space down here is my go-to format. It's just something I wrote one time, I really liked it, so I always copy and paste right in there. It um, goes through and it changes the axis title to a particular size and it folds it, um, changes the text to a size, it could also fold it if I wanted to, um, changes the plot title, legend text, legend title. So I'll go ahead and do this. And here's, a, here's the new one. with title up there, it's bolded, it's easier to see, the legend's bolded, figure values, um, it's going to be a nice, nice plot, and then we can go and save it to a reasonable width and height that's not going to crash your computer, say 7 and 5, um, and so say trig.png, plot trig, device off, and let's see what my working directory is. That's another nice thing of R. You can type in there dir and then parentheses, and it'll tell you everything that's in your directory, and it will sort it by. Um, there it is, trig.png. It'll sort it by alphabetical order. So instead of waiting for this thing to load, I'll just do it the nice computer science way and just ask the directory what's in there real quick, and it'll let me know. So a trig is in there, and um, if I did want to see it though. So now I'm going to hit save, okay? So now we're going to save what we did, and if you changed anything, make sure you save it, all right? So now that we've saved, let's go back to tea time, our repository that we had, and this was kind of open, just sitting there. Uh, it does, you, this does not have to be open at the same time, you just have to open it up to not look at things. So I've changed some things, and so I'm going to ask it, I'm going to ask Git, what is the status um, What's the status of the repo? And that didn't, I changed something, didn't I? Um, all right, now let's ask it. Well, that's a little weird. 
maybe this is, I have two up here, so make sure I'm saving this in the right folder. Yeah, no, it's in there. We'll call this uh, an example. You haven't done the ad. Oh, well, it should tell me that I changed something in there. This is really kind of funny because. Is this making sense to you? <laughs> Never. Get oh, I'm in the wrong repo. I'm in Git example. Okay, hold on. We're going to go back to uh, this Git. Save that in there, and now it should work. Computer's never wrong, unless it tells me that I didn't update. Okay, all right. So now it's right. So if you did get status, it should have tell, told you that something changed. So in this one, it says uh, there's an untracked file. All of a sudden, code scripts t time example is now sitting there, and uh, it says you need to track it. So I'm gonna write for now git add dot, which is really git add all, so it's going to add that in there, and if I hit git status again, it will say uh, you have a new file, but you have to commit it. Um, so committing something is telling what it did, so uh, I'm now going to commit, git commit, make sure there's a space there, dash, or um, dash m, quotes, and I'm going to say Example for uh, did uh, yeah example for t time. Okay, I'm gonna hit that. It's gonna commit it, and now um, if I hit get status, it'll say you're good. You already did it, but you're ahead of the master by one commit because you changed something. Um, use git push to publish this to. Get bucket and put it on the re repo. So I'm going to hit git push. And it usually will ask you for your. Um, oh, it actually failed to push because I'm on master and Jack put some new things on here. So the way that you pull from master is to use git pull. And we're going to ignore that. We'll talk about what just happened later a little bit with Jack. Um, and so now I'm going to get push, push all my stuff up there. Now it's there. If we go back to Bitbucket, and if I look at um, 16 SDLE, not that one, this one, the regular SDLE. Nope. Oh, nope, that's Rogers. That's, no, that's somebody else's. 16 SDLE T10. Well, it's good to see there's plenty of ports. A bunch here. of people have already been them. Here it is. All right. So now we have 14 forks, which is great to see that we have 14 forks sitting there. Um, we've got some watchers now. I just committed 33 seconds ago. Um, first, I merged, which is something we'll talk about later. Um, and I wrote an example for T10. Um, so actually, I can go to the commit. And I can say, you know, let's look at which one happened here. And it'll tell me, oh, you added this whole file. And if I had changed the file, it would be red. But Jack will talk more on that. Um, and the last thing to do, and we'll do this again when we um, meet again, is if we go to 16 SULT time, and I'm going to go to mine. Mine is going to say that I am two commits behind uh, in my SDLE Ethan one that I made. I'm actually behind because master changed something, they updated it or whatever, and I can hit sync now and hit sync. It will sync it up. And as it's doing that, we can come over to where um, SDLE T time Ethan is, and I can get. Pull, 
and it will now pull the new things that just were up there. Um, and it told me which ones uh, it was doing, and now I should be able to, actually it said I have some issues because I have some untracked. So what happened was, is because I was being quick the other time, and in get example, I want this, I delete this out of here. Get full. Uh, what just happened was I saved the file into the repo and then I saved it into the other one and pushed it up. And then I tried to pull into the repo where I already saved the exact same file name and it's going to say well, you can't do that because the exact same one is sitting there. So I'm going to pull again and it should be all right. All right, there it is. So now it said we just added into your repo because you synced the T time class example. And I think on there now, Jack's presentation's on there, on the repo. So now you can take it over. As Ethan uh, demoed briefly, um, I'm going to be talking further about Git. Um, Git is a version control system. Basically, th what that means is we can keep lots of versions of files without there being multiple copies. So the, the biggest example is say you're writing a paper and you drafted your first version, and then you duplicate the version and rename it version two, and then keep writing. Well, that takes up a lot of space, and it's not a very good way to organize files. So Git is something you can use with code, or you can also use it with common text files like Word documents, uh, etc. Okay, so I'm going to just walk through a little bit about what uh, Git is. So Git is basically a database of our versions. We have version 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, and then here's your text editor, right? And you're working on your current file. What happens is the file will point to your current version. So say right now I'm on version one, uh, and I have that what we call checked out. So you check out a certain version or a certain point in time of your project. Right? So I can check out version two, version three. A great thing about Git is you can have multiple version databases, so you can point to uh, a file in someone else's version of, or someone else's, else's version database. Um, so now, as Ethan showed you, Bitbucket acts as this central repository. So in this case, this would be Bitbucket, um, our version of the uh, SDL T-Time repository. And then these over here represent your forks, actually. So these are like each of your versions of the version database uh, on different computers. Um, and of course, you can contribute back to the central repository. The key is this is all in the cloud, so you have a backup of your Git history. Okay, one of the key concepts of Git is snapshots. So how I mentioned before of how you typically might keep track of versions where you copy one version and then edit the new one. What Git does is it actually doesn't save the complete file at every point in time. Because if it had, say you had like a two megabyte megabyte file and you and Git would save it every time you can see how that clearly would grow in size and soon you'd be at multiple gigabytes for a simple two megabyte file. So the way snapshots work are you have files and then here's time along the x-axis and then each of these is the file corresponding version so for file A this is version A1 file B, uh, B1, C1 so let's say we go ahead and we make a change to A. So at this point in time, it would say, all right, you made a change to A, but what if we don't change B? Well, what Git does is it kind of says, all right, we're using the same file as before. So it doesn't copy over it, it makes what's called a snapshot. So kind of like a ghost reference 
the previous version. Uh, so we could also, in this case, change C2. And so this column right here represents a state, which we'll go to later. So in this, I edited A, so it saves a new file. B1, because I, in this, at this point in time, I still haven't changed file B. And then for file C, I don't have any changes, so it keeps a snapshot uh, of C2. Uh, and then finally, no changes to A3, changes uh, to B1, making it version B2, and changes to C2, making it version C3. As I briefly mentioned, each of these columns uh, is a state, and what that's represented in Git is something we call a commit. So you'll often hear people saying, I'm committing code or I'm committing this to the repository. That means you're saving a certain state to the repository. So states are stored in the .git directory of your project. So when you go and create a new Git project, uh, there's actually a directory in there that uh, has the prefix of a dot. And what that does is when you would go in, say in your file explorer on your system, it doesn't show hidden files on most systems. So you can't actually see this, but it's a directory and it has a bunch of stuff uh, behind it that stores uh, information about the certain states, etc. So to identify a state, what Git does is it looks at your file and uh, creates what's called a hash, uh, which is just taking the text and converting it uh, to a series of numbers and letters. And so this is what we use to identify each state or commit in our version. Uh, okay, so I think the, the last thing I'll mention today is the, uh, or I have 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. I was over. So the Git workflow, so this is when you're editing projects and you want to save stuff to Git, you have uh, three areas, your working directory, which is the file structure you see on your computer, what is available at you, for you at any time. The staging area, so that's when you would say git add, so you would make changes and now you add them to the staging area. So I stage the file, and then when I commit it, it gets saved as a state in .git. Uh, as I mentioned before, we can also check out a version. So Using that large hash, we can say git checkout and then the hash, and then it'll revert back to that state. It'll go and git, fetch that state, and bring it back to the working directory. So that's now the file that you're editing uh, in, the, in the version database. Okay, so now I'm gonna do uh, a little bit of git in the command line. Ethan already showed you some, uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and just introduce you uh, to a little bit more of the command line. So I think it's important to really understand what's going on here in the command line. So what the command line really is, is just a text version of browsing files, right? But the way we interact with it is we give it text commands. So right now, the tilde means I'm in what's called the home directory. So I am logged in as Jack and I have I'm currently in my home directory. So if I were to type in the command ls or list, it would list all the items that are in my home directory. In this case, because they're highlighted yellow, I'm gonna make that a little bit bigger. So because they're highlighted yellow, I know that those are directories. Um, so I can, as Ethan showed, change directory into something like code. Once again, now I'm in, here's the path. So the path is now home directory code. So from that, I can tell that I am in the uh, code directory and I can list right there. So I have a bunch of other directories. So I can go into something like uh, case, uh, list again, and so I could go into um, SDLE, and you see here's the repository that um, the 
SDLT time, which is the repository that you just uh, pulled from Bitbucket. Um, I'm not going to do anything with that repository right now. I'm going to show you how to start a fresh new Git project. So I'm going to open up a very basic text editor, um, something you probably wouldn't use, but it's just for demonstration purposes. So put in some text, go ahead and save this. Before I save it, I'm going to make my directory, and I'm going to call this demo. So once you make the directory, you want to change into the directory. So now, if I'm in here and I list, there's nothing in there, right, because I just made that directory. So to start a new git project, you just say git in it, so for initialize. And so it says initialize an empty git repository, and as you can see, Here's our path, and then it created that .git folder, which um, holds all of our Git information and states. So if I hit ls, you notice I don't see anything. The reason why is because it's prefaced with that dot. So to see what are known as hidden files, I can say ls-a for all. And so now you can see I have the .git uh, directory showing. So I initialized my Git repository, so now I can go back here, hit save, so go to the SDLE demo, save it here as sample.txt for text, um, asking for some weird stuff. So now I'm going to clear my screen, and if I hit Git status, we get a common uh, screen which shows what um, is currently untracked in the staging area. So going back to the slides real quick, this is what this represents. So this is a text version of, the, of this visual, mm -hmm. right? So this is represented as text. And so I can see I have this untracked file, and so I, I can go ahead and add that. So I go git add, right? So by adding it, I moved it from the working directory to the staging area. So it's not yet committed to my code base. If I hit git status, it will have changed to green, and it says here are some changes to be committed. So this is our staging area. Let's say I added something, but I don't want that in my or I want to pull something out of the staging area back into my working directory, I can just say git reset and then the name of the file. And if I go git status, we're back to where we are. But I know I want to add the file. And when I say add dot, dot represents everything in the working directory. So everything in the demo folder. I'm going to add that, and then I'm going to go git commit. Um, and I will enter. And so now this looks really strange, probably for a lot of you. This is something known as Vim. So it's a text editor that's built in the terminal. And um, I don't know if you can see, but my cursor is somewhere up there. And to start editing, I hit I for insert. And you notice down here, to change to insert mode, so I can uh, call this my initial commit. And so that'll be the message that goes along with that hash, right? Because it's very good to be descriptive about what your commits are doing. To get out of insert mode, which I'm still in down here, I hit escape, and then shift to ZZ writes the file. So now if I go get status, it says, nothing to commit working on a clean directory, right? So I added the file, I have no more changes. If I were to go back to that file and change something and hit git status, um, which I'll do really quick. So let's say for some reason I just remove the period, save it again, go down here and see my status. I see that this file has changed. 
But what if I accidentally deleted that period? And I'm curious, what did I change about that file? There's something called a diff or difference between files. So I can simply go and say git diff. And so it's going to show me the line in that file that changed. So it's saying originally you had uh, hello, my name is Jack, period, but now there's no dot right there. Um, so say I see that change and I'm like, oh, I don't want that anymore. What you can do to revert changes to files is a checkout. So you can say git checkout, and then I'm just going to check out all the files in my working directory, but you could enter a name on the file if you would like. So I can do git checkout, and you'll notice one thing about some terminals is that they keep track of, hey, with the asterisk, you had changes, now we have no none, and I can confirm that with get status, and we have nothing uh, to commit. Um, so I think that's where I'll stop for today. <coughs> Any questions you have about the terminal using git? So get how many started? people here is git new to? Okay. So. Why, it might seem a little bit bizarre, like why is this useful? Why would you bother doing this? Couldn't you just save your R files and email them around to your friends? But as you just see, we made this repository and all of a sudden 17 people have pulled a copy of all the codes we've been working on. And it's a system which allows us to make changes and keep track of them. And you never have that problem of having to track changes in Word and then merge everyone's results and getting everything all messed up. And so you can actually collaboratively work on things with other people. So you're writing scripts, you have data. You, as long as you do everything with text files, which is pretty easy to do, then you can work very collaboratively in a team. So in our group, we all just share these repositories and I can borrow some code from Ethan and go, oh, that's going to be a whole lot better when you plot this. And I can just grab it from him so you can share it very easily. And then, if things go wrong, you might be working on something for a week. You think, oh, this is going to be the best thing to do of all. And then you realize, oh, that didn't work at all. This keeps a full record of everything, all the prior commits. And you can back up in time and get the last version that was much better. And so it makes a really big difference. And it's a foundation of doing collaborative data science, or what we refer to as open data science. So GitHub and Bitbucket are places which are full of all kinds of codes that people are sharing and projects. And so it's a real, I think it's actually maybe one of the most important parts, even though it might look a little bit bizarre. And yeah, one thing I forgot to mention is you can actually view your history by doing git log. So there's that hash that's associating with the first commit I did, and then you can see commit message, initial commit, and some information about the time at which it was committed. So git log is really good for going back and figuring out what the hashes were so that you might be able to go back and forth. But we'll, we'll talk about that more uh, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yes? Could you show us the file? Uh, just want to see the period of the So this? Yeah. Um, it shouldn't be. I'm not sure if this text editor is integrated with Git. But if I so it's supposed to be there. The yeah, Git. it would be there. I think if I opened it again, um, I can actually look at it inside of Vim. So if I go in here, there you see is. the periods there. Yeah. And that stuff at the top is just some information about the file that the program dumps in there. Um, I don't even understand it, but it's there. Mm -hmm. So with Git, you're just having it. Git is a little server, and you're just telling it, OK, I'm working, I'm working, I'm working. OK, I want you to register and keep track of any changes to this file. That's when you do the add. And then I want to commit, and I'm going to say, really keep this. Here's what I was doing. And then git push, you push it up to your repository. So when your hard drive crashes, which it will, you won't lose anything. Um, another thing with the repository, if you guys want to, for everyone that forked, if you go to the master one and you hit watch, you'll, you will get an email for every single commit that happens. So yeah. if you're interested, go hit watch, and you can watch as we commit things up on there. And it will let you know, okay, now I should sync because there's new stuff on there. Um, I watch a couple repositories.
series and Jack watches mine and I can see all the times that Jack is sitting there committing all these different things like uh, obsessively like for when, an hour. So when people are writing their thesis as their advisor, it makes me very comfortable when I can see that they're progressing on completing their thesis. Because I just watch their repository with this little eyeball, you hit a button, and then I read their commit message saying, okay, literature review done. Ah, my results are done. Oh no, it all doesn't make any sense. I'm panicking. Oh, I feel better like now. It's going in there. Yeah. Cool. And tomorrow we'll continue uh, more on Git, and then we might move into something.